Coming up on Tech News Today, Google launches an Evernote competitor. Chrome OS and Android will not be allowed to join together in love. They'll be separated, says Eric Schmidt. Also, why Facebook is losing in Asia. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, March 21st, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker looking for video, photos, illustrations, music, sound effects, after effects templates, or 3D models, check out Pond5. And for an exclusive 50 free stock media files, go to pond5.com slash TNT. And by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create a professional website, blog, portfolio, and now an online store. Check out their new commerce solution so you can start selling stuff immediately. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TNT3. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zaktar. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show we keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world starting each time with the top 10 stories of the day in... <laughs> The news feeds. Google launched its new note-taking service called Keep Wednesday afternoon. You can go to drive.google.com slash keep in any web browser or download the Android app from the Google Play Store. Service lets you create notes, lists, and photos, and the mobile app also allows voice recordings and transcription. Google Executive Chairman Eric Schmidt, you know him, says Android and Chrome are not dating. Speaking to reporters in India, Schmidt said that although management changes are afoot, Android and Chrome will not be combined. Schmidt was also asked about rumors that he himself might be leaving Google. He called those rumors completely false. Let's talk a little bit more about Google. Droid Life posted a preview of the new Google Play app for Android. Version 4.0 would be image-centric and makes the look of Play more in line with the recent Google redesigns. This appears to be a revision, not a total overhaul, so don't just expect some more boxes around things and some italicized fonts. Droid Life posted a six-minute video demoing the new unreleased app. If you're waiting for standard and mobile payments, get comfy, folks, because during the Barclays Emerging Payments Forum on Wednesday, Visa CEO Charlie Scharf indicated he thought it was appropriate to charge a fee to services like PayPal and Google Wallet. MasterCard recently announced just such a fee. Visa and MasterCard have their own competing mobile payment platforms. The official BBC weather Twitter account and the BBC Arabic account were hijacked for nearly three hours by supporters of Syria's president Bashar al-Assad. The hackers, calling themselves the Syrian Electronic Army, posted a series of spoof weather reports attacking opponents of the Assad regime, including Israel, Lebanon, Turkey, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia, as well as Britain. Stop me if you've heard this one. The iPhone lock screen can be bypassed because of a bug. Actually, this is a new bug affecting the latest version of iOS 6.1.3. Unlike the last bypass, which required a super awesome combination of swipes and taps, to bypass 6.1.3, you'll have to eject the SIM tray while dialing a number. From there, you'll have access to contacts and photos. The next web reproduced the behavior on an iPhone 4 and a 4S, but not on the iPhone 5. The bug was shown off on YouTube by a person going by the name of Videos de Barriquito. Wait a second. A guy using a paperclip to bypass security. More like mm. Videos de MacGyver Ito. <laughs> Uh, you've heard this one before, but it's a new version of the same thing. Illegally downloaded music does not have a significant impact on music sales, and freely streamed music provides a small boost to music sales. Those are two conclusions from a study of 16,000 Europeans conducted by the Institute for Prospective Technological Studies as commissioned by the European Commission Joint Research Center. Of course, the international music industry body, IFP, disagreed with the findings of the report. Apple Insider noticed that Apple's filed a new patent describing a group of methods to protect a dropped iPhone while it's in flight, I guess you could say, or <laughs> careening to the ground, and minimizing damage. The filing includes a rotational mechanism to change the orientation of a falling iPhone, as well as on-device thrusters, a way to clamp down on inserted cables when a fall is detected, and would allow it to put its most impact-resistant surface forward to meet the ground. 
Up next, the iCat, which always lands on its feet. <laughs> HP Labs is showing off a new prototype for glasses-free 3D LCD screens. The key advance here is an increased viewing angle. Nano-patterned grooves in the backlight send blue, green, and red light in multiple directions, giving you a 180-degree viewing arc. The one-half-millimeter screens can send only the light seen from a given viewpoint, 200 different uh, perspectives for photos, 64 different directions for video, the hang-up could be capturing all that information, uh, which could mean lots of cameras and lots of bandwidth for downloading and viewing it. A million users isn't cool. You know what's cool? A billion users. If that's the case, then YouTube is very cool. YouTube announced it has now more than one billion unique visitors each month. According to YouTube's data, there was a 76% increase in smartphone traffic compared to last year at the same time. Desktop traffic increased 33%, but the real takeaway here is that YouTube thinks you're unique. You look like, like a snowflake. A snowflake like likes watching Harlem Shake videos. <laughs> I was wondering if you were going to go the, the the social network reference or the uh, one billion reference, you know. One, but nah, that, I, I like, I, the pinky thing is played out. Yeah, yeah. It, well, kind of. Now it is. We need, we need a new one. I done killed it. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Pond5. If you're looking at your video or your audio project, and you're like, man, all these sound effects, all these shots I got, they're played out. You need Pond5. It's a stock media marketplace with literally millions of photos, vector illustrations, music tracks, sound effects, customizable motion graphics templates, 3D models, and more. Collections growing all the time. They got more than 10 million clips in there, uh, 10 million professional quality photos and vector illustrations and all that stuff. And Pond5 is great for artists who make things too. If you, I mean, if you make those clips, if you're like, mine is not played out, mine is in fact awesome, share it with the world and make some money off it. You get to set the price. You get 50% of the royalties. That's higher payout than other stock photo marketplaces. And as a result, the prices at Pond5 are unbeatable and so is the quality of the content. You can, you can find giraffes and sound effects of pretty much anything you can imagine in there. Here's what you do. You want to see the breadth and scope of what's available at Pond5? Go get 50 free stock media files right now by going to pond5.com slash TNT. That's P-O-N-D, the number 5.com slash TNT. And try it out. Uh, download some clips that you can use in your project that are then legal. You don't have to risk like, uh, I hope nobody catches me using this thing. Go to pond5.com slash TNT now. And uh, we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. All right, joining us now, uh, we're very happy to have the editor of Games and Gear and host of the longest-running CNET podcast, The 404, Mr. Jeff Bacalar. How's it going, Jeff? Pretty good, guys. Thanks for having me once again. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. And uh, we got some interesting Google news. It's like a googly day today. Uh, Drive.google.com slash keep. I've tried it out on the web. Uh, it even works in iOS, actually. If you just go there in the Safari browser, it works just fine. You don't get all of the capabilities that you get in the Android app, like the voice transcription or the voice notes and stuff like that. But uh, typing saves instantly. I was doing this along with Gina Trapani. She was uh, she was showing it off on This Week in Google yesterday because because Leo and Gina uh, and, uh, and, uh, and folks found this right before the show started. Kevin Marks was on the show with him. I almost said Jeff, but Jeff wasn't there yesterday. You could type in like the web and it'll show up on your phone. Like it's like a little Google wave technology in there. So this is a, this is a lovely, simple, functional note-taking app, but we've got those. We've got Evernote. I use simple note, uh, which isn't as instantaneous as this, but I, I wonder, Jeff, do you even have a need for this sort of thing? And if you do, is this, is this likely to sway you to use Google keep? So, so check it out. I was using, uh, I just had this like note taking revolution recently, oh, yeah? uh, revelation rather. And, uh, I was using uh, post-its, <laughs> which is uh, pretty analog. And uh, I, I would literally like write stuff down and, and put it in my pocket. It's crazy. I, I, I know. And I tried using Evernote and Evernote for me is too complicated. I didn't, it, there was too many options. There was all these, you know, voice stuff and I was like I can't do that then I went to Astrid tasks have you ever heard of that yes no I haven't heard of that one I was using that for about a month and up until yesterday I was using it and now I'm I'm doing Google keep just because it's a lot more streamlined it's 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 just there's no real bells and whistles going on with it and I and I've been using it you know for 24 hours but I uh 
you know, I just really enjoy it. I like the simplicity of it. I like that it's color coded. And for what I want, for my needs, for my simple task needs, so far it's going pretty well. And I'm going to give it a shot. I'm probably going to go back to this guy, but we'll see. <laughs> you know, uh, I'd like to expand my horizons. Yeah. Yeah. That's what about, what about, oh, sorry. go ahead, Jason. No, I was just going to say that's a really good point. Evernote is great, and I've been using it for quite a while now, but you end up getting in this weird world of of hyper like tagging and sorting and everything that kind of peels you out of the, oh, I've got a quick note to just drop into the app and keep exactly. seems to be a little bit more streamlined in that regard. Um, yeah, I like it so far. I you think it's kind of make time to use Evernote. Ever, you know, like to, to write these little things down, you should just do it and forget it. Evernote has this whole ecosystem, mm -hmm. and uh, I just wasn't having it. Which is great if you get into the habit of using that. And, and over time, I've gotten very used to kind of the organizational aspects of Evernote um, and everything. One thing that I've noticed with Keep, at least on the Android app, which is a great app right out of the gate, um, is the voice dictation or the voice input only works mm -hmm. if you're actually saying words. Like I use these note-taking apps a lot of times to record ideas for songs, music, and everything. And if you do that, it won't do it. It's like it tries to transcribe it and it says, I can't, I don't know what you're saying right now. I can't record that. And so maybe they need to work on that a little bit and make it more broad to not just words that you're entering, but anything. It's interesting to me that there's, there seems to be a lot of sentiment of people saying, well, what does Keep doing that Evernote doesn't do? I mean, Evernote mm -hmm. is is a solution. It's a robust solution. Um, I kind of agree with Jeff that sometimes it can seem a little too robust. Like, I don't, I just want to remember a few things and make it simple on myself. But I mean, if you're living within the Google ecosystem, I know I am. This is just, it's a built-in functionality that Google is offering me where I don't have to use a third-party service. So I see nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's, it's a competitor to Evernote. We can't just we can't just assume that because Evernote is the most complex of maybe these these note taking and and and, and clipping and saving apps that that it should be the only option. I, I use Evernote pretty much every day because mm -hmm. I, I I'll use it for anything that comes into my brain or if I want to uh, clip something from a website I've used that clip function that they have. I mean Google Keep I think is an, an interesting first approach at, well actually second approach because this is Google Notebook 2.0. If everyone forgot about that I used to use that every day until Google killed that too. Mm -hmm. But Google Keep is really simple and I think that's just like the way they did email. Their email system wasn't anything revolutionary. It was like, hey, look, we have email too, and it's really, really simple. It's not super powerful. We don't do folders. I think Keep's got that same kind of feel where you have very basic tasks available, and I'm really glad that it breaks out that task function of Gmail, which I really didn't like as this little separate pop-up window. But Keep, I can see myself using it just because I'm usually using Google properties anyway, and I have to keep either the Evernote tab open or I can just always search in Google for all the things that are, is in my little Google universe. You know, with I mean, all that's, apologies that's, that's to our colleague and friend, Rafe Needleman, uh, I don't I don't use Evernote, never have used Evernote. I've always found it too complex for what I need. Uh, and I've used Simple Note because I use Notational Velocity on OS X. I use ReSoft Notes uh, on Windows. I use an open source program on Linux that I can't recall the name of right now. But what I like about that is it's not one company controlling everything. Simple Note is controlling the sync of the notes for me right now. But if Simple Note decided to go away, I'd be able to fairly easily replace all of that because everything is synced locally. Now, I know Drive does that, and this is going to sync with Drive, but I'm with O'Malley, who wrote today, look, you just took away Google Reader, which I leaned upon for years. Now you want me to use the simplified notes system? Uh-uh. If I got something that's working for me, there's no way I'm switching to that right now. I feel like uh, there, there's there's a bigger thing going on here. Like they're doing this. You know, Google is a great company. Be, well, they're great at convincing an entire generation of people to voluntarily disclose information. All right. So they're do, some. This is the start of something bigger. They're gonna use this data. They're gonna collect it. They're just learning more about you. I mean, I think it's safe to assume that Keep will you know, talk to another Google product at some point and continue to, you know, learn more about you than the government does. Another way they want to learn more about you is having you use their operating system, not on the phone, but also on the laptop, not just on the phone. Uh, but Derek Schmidt kind of reigned on the, the idea that maybe... Uh OS, Google Chrome OS, and uh, Android would be coming together, huh, yes? Yeah, Eric Schmidt was giving a talk at Google's Big Talk, a Big Tent event, not Big Talk event, in India, and he says that Chrome and Android are going to remain separate for a very long time, 
because they solve different problems. Uh, he said that the two operating systems would share more commonality, but probably not merge for a while. On the fact that Chrome and Android now have the same man in charge, Sundar Pichai, Schmidt said, we don't make decisions based on who the le leader is. He says that Google makes decisions on where the technology takes them. Now, Jeff, Apple and Microsoft both have two operating systems. They have a desktop operating system, a mobile operating system. Why is it people are so crazy about smashing together Android and Chrome OS when it comes to Google? I don't know. I think uh, it's all, you know, to me, it's it's what I, I fear the most is is having, you know, one not work as well, like one platform working better on a, a mobile phone than it does on a standard computer. So that's the, the worry that I keep having in the back of my mind, you know, as like iOS and, and, and you know, uh, uh, OS 10 get closer and closer together. That I don't I don't know what it is. I have this like inherent fear. That's my that's my whole take on the whole thing. That's what I you know, freak out about. And I, and I think you can apply that logic to, to what's going on with, uh, with Chrome and Android, though. Tom, Microsoft kind of used this one giant approach kind of thing to their operating systems, and it's basically confused and irritated a lot of desktop users. Do you think Android on a laptop would confuse people? I think they're different. And, and we have not seen anybody take a phone operating system and put it on a, on a laptop. Uh, we, we, what we see with Microsoft is them trying to do a tablet interface and put it on a laptop, which is closer, and that is confusing the crap out of people. And it's still, it's still too early to say whether it's for sure a failure or a success, but uh, it's definitely off to a rocky start at best. I don't think those are the same things. And I used to have this argument a lot on Buzz Out Loud. I think you need a different operating system for the phone for the small device than you need for the bigger device. And the idea yeah. of unifying them is is probably a bad idea because they have different requirements and different ways of working. You can try to unify the interfaces, which is what Microsoft's doing from Windows Phone to Windows 8 so that you have a, a similar look and feel. That's not a bad idea. iOS and, and OS 10 have been trying to do that as well. Nobody's really succeeded at that either. They're, ju they're just different devices. Make the device work really well. That's what I want. Sarah, do you think the app should work in like between different operating systems? The fact that you have a desktop version of, of Chrome, you have a desktop operating system mm -hmm. and a mobile operating system, would it benefit both to have Android apps available on Chrome OS? Well, I mean, it might benefit someone like me who's not going to use Android at all otherwise. I mean, that's just not the operating system that I have on my phone. So right now, even if I want to dabble in Android, it's like, well, I have to get a new phone and that's not, that's not going to happen. So if there was some way for me to have access to Android apps, and you know, that that is... That is something that we're going to see more of, uh, be, being able to to, um, to to access apps that are previously only known to be on Android smartphones. That makes me part of the whole Android experience. It's, it's not like I'm avoiding it on purpose. It's just too hard for me to access now. So if it was something that I could access on a laptop of some kind, why not? Yeah, but I'm going to do this preemptive thing. There's blue stacks. You can run that on Mac and Windows. You can run Android apps on a laptop if you want. So you can hold off on all the emails there. Right. But uh, the thing is, I think it would really bolster up Chrome OS in general because the thing about it, the big drawback is you can't have local apps on there. But I think if people are used to using their Android apps and that pixels out there with that touch screen, it seems like it might be believable that a user could go, oh, I know this app. I'm going to use this on my Chrome OS device as well as my Android device. All right, let's move along to mobile usage, not just interface. Uh, and Sarah's got an interesting take on why YouTube and Sapphires go together. <laughs> well, so we mentioned in the news, Fuse, that, Google, uh, that, that YouTube, a Google property, uh, has hit 1 billion monthly users and that uh, year over year, it is a 76% increase in smartphone traffic. Big surprise. Um, only a 33% increase in traffic from desktop. So obviously, you see where the trend is coming from. It's it's kind of interesting. Um, it's a post on Google's AdWords agency blog where they made this announcement, and they also call the current generation of people who access YouTube on a variety of different devices Generation C. So I guess we're all sort of part of that generation now. Um, but but what I think is interesting about this is like okay, so we've got all these people that are accessing YouTube on smartphones. Yes, uh, you know you you've got uh, viral videos and and subscriptions, and YouTube does it all. So I don't think that's Terribly surprising that 
many, many, many people on earth are accessing uh, YouTube on a regular basis. But so what about all those mobile phones that we're holding? Uh, manufactured Sapphire, which is like military grade, super, super, it, it's, it's powerful, doesn't crack when you drop it, can't be scratched with keys, or if you throw your phone on a sidewalk, that's the next thing, right? Gorilla Glass right now, this is what's covering my iPhone. My iPhone is full of scratches. If you watch i5, you see close up that, it, you know, it's it's not really that scratch resistant. Um, and we've heard a little bit about Sapphire because Apple uses it right now to protect the camera on the iPhone 5. You know, it, we heard Sapphire for the first time and everyone's like, precious jewels, oh my gosh. But what's cool is that if you don't know that much about Sapphire, it's crystalline form of aluminum oxide and only diamonds, only diamonds are harder as far as naturally occurring uh, materials, which is pretty cool. And Gorilla Glass, the thing about it, which is made by Corning, the thing about Gorilla Glass is it's a lot cheaper than what a sapphire display would be. Uh, Gorilla Glass costs about less than three bucks, while a sapphire display would cost about $30 per unit, but that could uh, fall below $20 in a couple of years, uh, say some analysts who are following this sort of thing. Or you have the other, um, it's kind of like what they do with jewelry when you're allergic to cheap metal and they'll just gold uh, cover, they'll cover the cheap metal and it's a very, very thin layer of gold. If you did something like a super thin layer of sapphire over another material, maybe that would be a key to a price drop as well so that we'd all have these phones, you know, where we can just chuck them at a wall or, you know, slice them with a knife and they're not going to, they're not going to, uh, they're not going to show anything because they're made of sapphire or at least they're coated in sapphire. Jeff, does this excite you? Maybe it's just the jewel thing that I get all excited about. I'm thrilled about <laughs> this, actually. What I know, what I want to know is, can you, can you, you know, how you can make diamonds sort of synthetically, right? Like the yes. way they do it for like uh, tipping drills and stuff like that. Why can't they do that with uh, sapphire for this? What, what's the problem with this? Why, why, why can't? Well, we no, do that? That, that, that that's exactly what this is. It's manufactured. Oh, so it is. It's, it's a process of creating sapphire. It's just an expensive process at this point. Uh huh. I mean, yeah, that's, I think that's really, you know, that's become a big selling point for, uh, I feel like people who are looking for a new phone, they, you know, a lot of people are, you always see like the razor test or the key test and stuff like that, uh, on YouTube and whatnot. But for me, that's now become a bullet point on the, the list of items that I need to check off before I buy a new product. So <laughs> make it indestructible. I don't want to be able to, you know, get to the point where people are just chucking them because they're indestructible but there's probably a, a common like a, a common medium there that we can all get on board with right now as corning does say that they're making gorilla glass i think that the next generation of gorilla glass is supposed to be four times mm -hmm. as scratch resistant as the current generation do you find that you have scratch problems is it just me is it because i'm throwing stuff in with my keys um, I don't carry a phone very often, and I'm usually using test units. So the phones I do get, which I throw in my bag or my pocket, they've survived, but I only have them for a couple of weeks at a time. Uh, but I'm usually quite careful because I know if I see a scratch on my device, I can never unsee it. <laughs> yeah. I will always see it. Even if it's imperceptible to anybody else, I will stare at that. So anything that makes these devices tougher, that's a, a big plus for me. On top of that, if the way gla I mean, glass and sapphire, I'm not sure how sapphire works when it comes to radio waves passing through it. But if you don't have to have so much metal in a device, it can make it a little lighter theoretically, or it could just be a better unit when it comes to uh, its radios. And that to me is somewhat important. Because you know, when you're on the device, you kind of want to have data on there. I know it's a, a crazy idea I want to have, because they always have data. But a strong device, that'd be great. Because I mean, I'm always dropping things. Uh, my briefcase just broke and I dented my laptop, which is not resistant to this yet. Ouch. I just wanted a spray can <laughs> that I could, I could just like you could do it with your briefcase, just spray sapphire. A all spray over, on you know? sapphire. Yeah. <laughs> what, what would stop you from doing that to yourself? Then you'd be like, um, that, uh, white, the white queen. Yeah, that could be your new superhero <laughs> name, the Sapphire Man. No, you know the one thing I took out of this story is that we're definitely going to see this from Apple because what's one company that doesn't care about the cost all the time? Apple. What's one Good company point. that's already using this at a product? Apple. So I don't know if we'll see it in the next version of the iPhone, but they're they're definitely on this. They're gonna sue Diamond somehow. It'll be the it'll be the iPhone 5s. Nothing is different. The like S the, is for Sapphire. S is for, <laughs> for Sapphire. There you go. Duh. Beautiful. Mwah. Done. Yep. Beautiful. Nothing's different, like, but it's made of sapphire. sapphire. <laughs> Buy it. It's twice as much. Uh, let's take a quick break. Thank our sponsor that also begins with S, Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create a professional website, blog, portfolio, and now online store. If you are selling 
pictures of sapphires or actual sapphires, you can use the new Squarespace Commerce. It provides a powerful and flexible e-commerce solution integrated to work with every Squarespace template. So you get the award-winning design. So your, your site looks gorgeous. You didn't have to lift a finger to do it. You just a little customization, make the colors work right. Uh, and then you get mobile responsive design. So if people are on a little tiny phone with a sapphire coating or they're on a big old laptop, desktop, 42-inch screen, doesn't matter. Your site adapts. The images are resized seven times, so they look right. The layout adapts. It looks right. And then you've got your store there because it integrates with all this stuff. The Squarespace template allows sales of both digital and physical goods, fast merchant account setup so you can accept payments right away by credit or debit card, and a single interface for order management, tracking orders, providing customer email updates, printing shipping labels, and adding coupons. Squarespace Commerce is included with a business plan subscription. Starts at $24 a month when you sign up for a year or $30 for the monthly plan. Now you can say, Tom, those are a lot of words, but what do I? how do I evaluate those words? that you just said without looking each one up in the dictionary and m making you take a lie detector test here's what you do sign up for a free account at squarespace.com and no you don't need to give them a credit card just an email address try it out start building your website if you decide to purchase squarespace use this offer code tnt3 and get 10 percent off your first purchase on new accounts. That includes monthly and annual plans. And don't forget with the annual plan, you get a free domain name registration. That's squarespace.com. Remember that offer code, TNT3, but definitely go try it out for absolutely free. Everything you need to create an exceptional website. And we thank Squarespace for their support of Tech News Today. Canon's got a couple of uh, fancy new DSLRs out there, Sarah Lane. Yeah. You know, the SL in Sarah, in Sarah Lane also is the SL in DSLR. Really? That, oh, I have that no idea. Right? Maybe that's oh, not right. Thanks, Canon. Know. Yeah, we haven't, talked about, uh, we haven't talked about cameras for a while on TNT, and these are really cool. The 100D is interesting because it is actually Canon's smallest DSLR ever. 28% lighter than the ES uh, 650D, which is you know, sort of comparable. 18 megapixel hybrid CMOS sensor. We've got a three inch capacitive LCD, multi-touch capabilities, uh, shoots up to four frames per second in burst mode, records full HD movies in 1080p. Uh, it's got a new autofocus system, which gives a wider focused area and faster autofocus performance. So while you're on the go. Also, when you're in movie mode, you can track subjects and focus on them continuously during video capture, which is anybody who's used DSLRs in video mode knows that that's really, really important. And, and when it doesn't have that functionality, it's kind of a mess. This is going to be available in April, $800 bundled in with a zoom lens kit. Then there's the 700D, which is basically the 650D updated. Um, also has 18 megapixel uh, hybrid sensor. Um, phase detect autofocus system. And what's neat about this is that when you're in uh, full HD video recording, which is also 1080p, you can also preview and apply filters in that movie mode, which is live or after the fact. But this is, it's, that's, that's, some, that's something new that we haven't seen before. This will be $900 again in April. This is in the US, um, at least US availability. Um, again, bundled in with that zoom lens kit. Jeff, are you a camera guy? Does this stuff excite you that the DSLRs are getting smaller and smaller, or, or are you more? No, this is, a, this is very good. I, I've been looking for uh, a DSLR for a while, and today when I read the story was the first time I heard about something. I mean, this is relatively affordable considering what uh, you know how much you can pay just for the body of a of a of a DSLR. Um, so I'm excited about that. I also think these types of cameras and lenses need to get in the hands of today's youth because I cannot <laughs> bear to watch any, any more videos that are filmed vertically and photos that are taken improperly. It's It doesn't I scare you that we've got hipster filters now built into the 700D for, for the youth of today's movie modes? See, Canon's smart. That's the bait. That's how you get them in. <laughs> you know, you say, oh, it's got like Instagram filters in it. They'll eat it up. So that's, good job, Canon. And all of a sudden they're pro professional photographers. I would so much rather have uh, 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 to look at these kinds of photos than than Instagram stuff for the rest of my life. If it's got a, as long as it's you know properly framed, put whatever filter you want on it anyway. That's fine. Well, they're calling it creative filters. I mean, the, the people do put filters on their real SLRs or DSLRs. So I'm hoping it's not the 
you know, craptacular effect of a Polaroid on your whatever 15 megapixel raw image, it's whatever a, it's, it's going to be. It's a fake hair on the front of your lens. <laughs> like your lens yeah. looks like it's cracked. <laughs> yeah. no, I, I don't know if it's going to be that kind of style of filter. Hopefully it's something much more, um, I don't know, professional looking than the Instagram yeah. stuff. Well, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, filtering out noise, for example, or, you know, adding some sort of a sepia tone. It doesn't have to be like... I don't know. I can't think of torn, one Instagram filter's name right now. Torn on edges. <laughs> right. Yeah. Some sort. It'll add some borders. Well, the fact that this is super light is also very important. I mean, the, the thing about it that stopped me about getting D DSLRs, except for the price. The price has always been very scary, and I know I would lose a ton of money to buying lenses because I get very obsessive like that. But this is light. Carrying around a DSLR is somewhat... Uh, cumbersome. Yeah. Oh yeah. And that's why the Micro Four Thirds have been so popular because you have this best of both worlds thing. If you can have a, if you can have a DSLR that's lighter and can handle, like, it's actually a low cost uh, device. It could get it in the hands of the youth, as Jeff is putting it. Yeah, I remember when you had to pay seven hundred dollars for a three megapixel point and shoot camera. You know, I mean, DSLRs have almost come down with the lens included to that. That's that's kind of amazing when you think about it. Well, I mean, think about it. There's two camera markets now. There's your cat, here's your the camera on your phone and SLR. There's really nothing in between. I mean, you can buy a point and shoot. It's you know, and now that this is going to be 800 bucks, that's sort of you know flirting with the with the idea of all right. Well, I might as well just bump it up uh, and, yeah. and go for something like this as opposed to just buying a point and shoot for sure. Now, if you want to keep an eye on what the youth of the world are doing, you might want to look at the We Are Social report uh, out of Singapore. Uh, we Are Social compiled active user numbers for social networks across Asia based on the reporting of those social networks. So it wasn't a survey or anything. It was self-reporting from the actual networks themselves. And what they found was Facebook rules everywhere but China, where they they aren't they're blocked so that that that's as expected but also japan and korea facebook not on top in fact japan the number one social network is line displacing twitter from the top the last time we were social looked at these 36 million active users of line uh, and threatening to take over facebook in thailand and taiwan line is a social messaging app you're able to make free calls. You're able to send stickers to your friends, play games with your friends, all in a little messaging app. In Korea, a similar app called Kakao Talk has displaced Psy World, not PS, but CY World, as the uh, top Korean social network. That's 19 million active users. And Kakao Talk is actually, uh, and I may be pronouncing that wrong, so I apologize, but it's threatening to take over Line in Japan, where they partnered with Yahoo Japan. Now, China, obviously Facebook and Twitter blocked there. Qzone is the top social app there. But WeChat is on its heels, and it's even increasing outside of China. 300 million users, 15% bigger than Facebook in Asia overall because it has China, of course. Next Web's John Russell points out that really what Facebook needs to do if they want to hold on to this market is gaming, stickers, video calls, in-chat multimedia, like the ability to watch YouTube videos at the same time with your friends, and possibly even payments there. Uh, because where Facebook is dominant, Singapore, Brunei, and Hong Kong, they all experienced a drop in social media penetration because Facebook usage slowed. This 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 was a revelation to me, you guys, because I'm like I you know I'm still using Twitter in in my website. I'm an old man, but what folks who are like on the cutting edge of this stuff out there, especially young folks, are doing is apps and chat, and that's their social network. Do you guys use anything like this? You know what's funny is the other day a friend of mine was talking about how somebody had like drunk dialed her you know late she goes he uh he messaged or he he called me online and i said what do you mean like with what she said online i'm like yeah but with what she was talking about the service line online oh. oh. it took me a minute i was like oh that okay i gotta write this down it's what the kids are using now and it, it, it's it's sort of fascinating the way that this stuff spreads and it's funny to think that someone's saying you know what Facebook really needs not to seem like, you know, the place for old fogies? Stickers. I mean, the, we've come to this, but that's the way it goes. You know, these these services get momentum and it's popular and people like them. And then huge, huge networks that have previously enjoyed having the, you know, the most millions or even in Facebook's case, billions of users... They have to adapt. Yeah, but it's Facebook. You've used it's, emojis, right, you guys? I mean, it's, it's I'm an emoji queen. Just, 
Yeah, that's the, it. The stickers is just like a bigger, badder version of emojis. But, you know, but emojis started in Japan, too. I mean, this right. is the sort of stuff where it's like it gains a following and people sort of go, that's weird. And then you kind of try it and then people start going like, I kind of like this. And then it sort of turns into something that it has become part of the online vernacular. And, and you almost have to have it. Yeah. <laughs> Does Facebook well, I, itself have to do stickers, or can they just have an application that does that? They have tons of apps. I'm pretty sure you could put an image on Facebook that looks like a sticker. Does no, Facebook but, no, itself have the, to bother to do this? See, you're thinking like me. You're thinking right. like an old man. Oh, sorry. Here's, here's what's going on. When you download, I downloaded all of these today and tried them out, and they all work pretty much the same. You download the app. When you sign in, it says, what's your phone number? That's all you need. You put in your yeah. phone number. And then it sends you a text message. You don't even have to leave the app because the notification comes up with a four-digit code. You put that in to verify your phone number. You're in. You're signed up. You are able to f access your contacts list, find all your friends. I actually online three, like the, uh, the my old next-door neighbor from Oakland, Rich Demuro from KTLA, uh, <laughs> and one other person were like, uh, there you go. You've got you've got friends online. <laughs> online. And, and the apps and the games and everything are right in there. So what Facebook is like, yeah, okay, Facebook has an app on its website, but in Messenger, can you get to those right. games? That's what they need to do. Well, I, I don't know about you guys. I'm a Viber addict. You guys use Viber at all? No. No. Tell us more. So Viber is like GroupMe, and I'm assuming it's similar to, to these, you know, ones as well. I don't know. I think uh, we, me and my friend started using it because we had a, a buddy move out to London. And the only way that we were able to keep him, you know, uh, in touch with him in real time, in the, a la like a, a text messaging, was through Viber. So Viber sends uh, messages uh, through data or if obviously if you have a Wi-Fi connection. So I have this like never ending, constantly, uh, uh, you know, active chat room with 15 of my friends. And that's how we communicate. It's faster than SMS and obviously MMS. You send uh, uh, pictures over it, and that is how I communicate. And then once I started doing that, you know, you sign up. And this is even a step uh, easier than what you were describing, Tom. You don't even have to uh, tell it your phone number. You just install it, and it says, okay, I know your number, and that's how it talks to all of your contacts. And you're, you're <laughs> always shocked. Dangerous. It's well, yeah. I mean, it doesn't, like, send out a text to everybody, but it lets everyone who is running Viber know that you've joined. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, wow. Well, so now I have on my phone five different group chats constantly going. I've got one for my ice hockey team. I've got one to talk about friends with hockey. I've got one just for people who live in Hoboken with me. We make plans. It's kind of crazy, but I use it a lot, and it's awesome. It's the, it's the app I use the most on my phone, hands down. You know, and the one thing a couple of people in the chat room have pointed out about Line in particular uh, is that, and, and a lot of these apps, it's true, they're crossing across platforms because it's in their best interest to do so in ways that other apps don't have. So Line, available on Windows Phone and BlackBerry OS 10 already. Uh, yeah. I, as you've got, you got our last discussion story, which is about some other apps that are crossing those lines as well. Yeah, I've got apps coming to Windows Phone. Pandora just launched for Windows Phone. Now, last year, Microsoft said this the Pandora would come out in 2013. They said that you get one year of unlimited ad-free listening with unlimited track skipping. You're not going to get that exactly. What you're going to get is unlimited skipping, unlimited uh, uh, ad-free listening. But just through the end of this year, Wired's got a hands-on. They said the app has some live tile functionality. So it's not just the same old run-the-mill app. You'll see the now playing info on the tile. There's built-in features for uh, stations, songs, bookmarking tracks. You can buy stuff on the Xbox Music Service. And then there's that other platform out there, BlackBerry. They just hit 100,000 apps in their BlackBerry World Store. They said they picked up 30,000 new games and apps in the last seven weeks. And they're touting that they have the Kindle. Now, Kindle app is there, Wall Street Journal, Open Table. And uh, BlackBerry was saying in the next coming weeks, they're going to have RDO, Skype, MLB at bat, and Jeff will be very excited to find out that Viber is coming to BlackBerry 10. Jeff, of the two mobile operating systems vying for third, because this is BlackBerry mm. 10 and, and Windows Phone here, really? which one do you think has got a chance? Oh, man. I don't, I don't know. I, it, I think just if you play the numbers, you, you'd say Windows. I just, and just from my own experience, I've yet to really meet anyone who uses uh, a new BlackBerry. So... Uh, I, I and I guess I know one or two people with a with a new Windows phone. So going on that unscientific research, that's what I'm gonna say. All right, sorry, I always like to throw this at you. We've got 150,000 Windows phone apps. We've got 100,000 BlackBerry apps. Either one of these have a chance. 
You mean the operating systems? It's based on the app store uh, selection, yeah. Uh, okay. I think just be, uh, we, and we were just talking about this yesterday, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's so important what apps are in your store, not necessarily, you know, who you are. However, I think that Microsoft is on the up here where BlackBerry is very much still on the decline. So if I just go based on that, the momentum that I feel, I feel like Microsoft, eh, I don't know. I, <laughs> I, I, uh, I'm not, I'm- It's I'm, the lesser of two evils. Kind of, well, it's, it's, it seems like they are slowly but surely making uh, cool connections with key companies, right? BlackBerry is kind of like the old guard and you just don't you don't hear you don't hear much. I'm not I'm not hearing a lot of excitement or momentum as far as um, as far as uh, that new version. So when it comes to the operating systems, I mean, apps are very important, but the way the operating system handles everything else is incredibly important. I thought that was going away with all the different apps out there. Then I got to try out the Z10, and okay, the operating system makes a big difference because this is terrible. This is absolutely an awful operating system when it comes to a phone. Windows phones got this thing beat. A hundred percent. See, and that's the thing. Like, and you're you're just what you've hung out with that for a couple of days. A couple of days. You're not going to develop anything for something that you think is junk. I thought it was it was it was incredibly. It's not ready yet. Okay. It shouldn't be out, <laughs> but it's out now. I'm not sure why. Tom, you got well, any takes on this? Just look at the way. Just look at the way that whole uh, press conference was was received. People, you know, with Windows, at least people are like somewhat interested. They're like, oh, what are, you know, what are they up to? For BlackBerry, it was like. Oh, they're still trying. Look at that. You know, that, that speaks volumes. I, that's just that's just you know, me. I, I my thoughts on this uh, are I, I I try I'm gonna try not to focus on what is actually happening right now, but it's starting to remind me of browser wars where you had mm. IE and Firefox and then everybody else. And some of them died off and some of them didn't. And you had your operas back there and then Google got in with Chrome and it was kind of weird for a while and they started to build. I think anything can happen in five years, but for a while, it's just going to be iOS and Android and everybody else. And yeah, Windows Phone may float to the top for a while and then who knows, Tizen may may get some momentum uh, and then BlackBerry may come back out of the pack or whatever. But it's just, I, I, I think being third is a Pyrrhic victory, at least for the next... For, Several years, and both these companies were offering money to developers to get more applications. The fact that BlackBerry is saying we got thirty thousand new apps in seven weeks—that's great and everything—but they there was a guarantee for some of these developers. Same thing with Win, with Microsoft offering a hundred bucks per app. I, I I'm just I think that Windows and Microsoft actually Microsoft's got the ability to withstand the hits for a couple of years, and they will eventually be back to number well maybe maybe two. <laughs> No, Tom, you, if that's you, how yeah, it's crazy feel about talk. things, yeah. I'm pulling for WebOS again then because I I kind of did like it. I thought it was okay. Wow, but, so you're that one guy with like that one like torch left. You're just like, okay, me and, and WebOS, <sighs> poor Jeff. The flame refuses to go out. <laughs> All right, uh, Jason, if you would, sir, please fire up the randomizer. Randomizer. <laughs> So Game of Thrones is premiering on HBO this Sunday in the United States. They had a premiere in Los Angeles in the normal way with their red carpets. And then they had a nerd premiere yesterday in San Francisco. Uh, and our very own Sarah Lane was there. I was there. It's not this Sunday. It's next Sunday. The 31st. Oh, that's right. 31st. So it's 10 I'm days just from too today. Excited. I'm not like, no, that I'm paying that much attention. This is what's really cool. So we don't get a lot of movie premieres where the stars of, you know, red carpet, that kind of stuff. In San Francisco, that usually happens in New York and Los Angeles and rare occurrences up in our up in our Bay Area. But what's interesting is that I was lucky enough to attend the premiere where I saw the first episode of season three of Game of Thrones. And it was a t- television series, not a movie, but it really felt like a movie premiere where a lot of the cast was in attendance. They sat right behind me and watched the watched the show with us. George R. R. Martin was there. They had a Q&A with him and the two producers um, who are responsible for basically bringing Game of Thrones to the screen um, from his for the adaptations of his book. And the the neat thing about it was that there were a lot of us going like, this is so cool. How, you know, how'd we all get so lucky? And that there is, there was a, um, a concerted effort to have premieres in places where they felt that people really appreciated the series and the tech world 
uh, no surprise to a lot of us, is, you know, we kind of go hand in hand in many cases with people who like fantasy and science fiction and all of that stuff. And George R. R. Martin, uh, who seems like a very nice man, uh, was, um, was, was he's, he's really aware of that. Um, and everybody at HBO is as well. So there was a lot of talk during the Q&A after we all watched the episode, which was really good, by the way, about, uh, you know, technology and fantasy and, and what it all means that that there is not everybody, but so many of us just kind of have this love for dragons. So now people of us. get more jealous. Can you show the photo of, of? Oh yeah, I sat on the Iron Throne. I drank some wine. Can't really see it. Oh, but cool. Yeah, that's it's. Right. I mean, that's that that's been at Comic Con for like three years running, so it's not really that great of a picture. But uh, it was really fun. Um, and uh, I don't know what else do you want to know, Tom? With the swords, with it, well, it sapphire. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be disappointed in ten days when I watch it. No, it's so okay. good. It's so so yeah. good. You get and a little that's not of everything. Just the wine talking. What? That's not just the wine talking. <laughs> no, it was really. I wasn't even drinking yet. Um, I right, that was at right. the after party. No, it was delightful. Well, I don't Sarah. know if you'd call it delightful. <laughs> it was good. <laughs> delightful Sarah, is not the was, word I use for Game of Thrones. What was the best uh, Q and A with uh, with Martin? What was like the best question? Oh, you know, um, he, he, at one point. They meant, he was asked something like, you know, what's your, you know, favorite social network or something? And he was just like, yeah, no, I, I still like, I, I don't, I don't even remember the kind of software that he said he used. He's like, Word star. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like 4.0 type of thing. Yeah. Everybody laughed. Um, yeah, he's, he basically, you know, he, he's, uh. He's living in his world here. A, a lot of people asked, you know, when are you going to finish the next book? And he's <laughs> looking like a little sweaty. He's like, I'm trying, I'm working on it. Oh, he hates that pressure. question too. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. that's all yeah. he ever hears. Right. <laughs> all right. When will uh, you write more of our fantasy world? <laughs> Why are you answering my question instead of working on your book, Mr. Martin? <laughs> oh, can I just, can I just say one more thing? Sure. Jamie Lannister, he's a tall drink of water. Uh. I never liked him because he's such a bad guy on the show. I liked him a lot in real life. O R L Y. Oh, I that guy's. R L Y. My wife loves know. him. Oh, oh my, my goodness! God. Hello. Let's see. Uh, let's let's let's. Do you, are you calm enough to I'm do okay. the calendar? Yeah, I think right, I think I can handle it. Uh, Twitter is celebrating 200 million users today, which also happens to be its seventh birthday. Yes. Seven years ago, Jack Dorsey tweeted that tweet that everyone retweets every so often that says, just setting up my Twitter, when Twitter was still spelled without any vowels. Uh, Asus is opening pre-orders for the phone pad in Taiwan. That's a seven-inch Android tablet that is also a phone, phone pad. And JVC is launching its first 8K projector. You heard that right, 8K. Look at that thing. Later this month in Japan for the low, low price of $261,000. It's actually sort of 8K. The way that it works is it's a display panel inside of the device that's half the resolution. So there's two images projected alternating at 120 hertz, and one is shifted slightly diagonally so it looks higher res, but it actually does not up the pixel count. I think oh. for that price, I want the pixel count to be doubled. Heck yeah. You know? Forget that's my Indiegogo to fund my purchase of this. I'm going to wait. Yeah. I want 8K for reels, but anyway, so if you've got $261,000, this is what you can buy. All right, let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. Got a comment from Andrew on Disney and uh, who owns ABC, their app that allows live streaming in some cases. Hey, TNT crew, it's Andrew calling from Anaheim, calling about what you were talking about on show 713 about ABC streaming live. Uh, ABC, of course, is owned by Disney, who also owns ESPN. ESPN has had a Watch ESPN app out for a little while, and this speaks to a greater trend for Disney. Bob Iger is known as being quite technologically forward-thinking. You remember Disney was one of the early investors in Hulu, and you also had those stories about the wristbands, the My Magic Plus wristbands that they're rolling out at the Disney parks and resorts. So it not really a surprise to me that ABC is the first one pushing forward on this, because that just seems to be how Bob Iger's taking the company. Thanks. Love the show. Good thoughts, Andrew. I, I can't say I disagree. I got an email from Christian. He says, hey, guys, I'm an Adobe employee who spent years working on Flash and Adobe Air. Your coverage of Kevin Lynch yesterday was good. No complaints at all. But I would like to add that although emotion sometimes ran high, very few people at Adobe, and nobody I knew, ever really hated Apple. 
We all still used our MacBook Pros, and although several people used the opportunity to give Android a try, many of us stuck with iOS. The reality is a lot of the passion and frustration we felt actually came from an appreciation for Apple devices. I think it's fair to say that Apple and iOS have had a profound impact on my career. I'm now on the web platform team pushing web standards and building next generation HTML, JavaScript, and CSS experiences. And although I have a ton of Android devices, several of which I really like, my phone of choice is the iPhone 5, and my tablet of choice is the iPad mini. In other words, there are no hard feelings whatsoever. Oh, well, that's good to know. Got Finally, another, some love. <laughs> yeah. Got another email from Brad who says, as a former employee of EA, Rit Richard Richitello, John Richitello was a great CEO. However, he did have some missteps during his career, most notable being the Star Wars of the Old Republic. That was a $150 million invested, Mass Effect 3 debacle, the Medal of Honor poor performance, and of course, the icing on the cake, the SimCity DRM poor launch. He did push EA from standard console strategy to digital with Origin. That was his doing, but it doesn't overcome the huge falls he took with the aforementioned titles. He says oh. uh, he see, he also says he's been a Twit fan since 2006, and he's based in Iraq. Nice. Uh, well, well, thank you, Brad. And uh, I uh, I want to point out that he called it the Star Wars of the Old Republic. So I don't know if that's an internal name, but that was not that was not Sarah saying that for those of you who want who are going to pick on her for that because i know somebody is going to go well that's not what yes, it's Sarah, why did you say it that way because i just wanted to upset the troops well not the, that's i meant yeah. the twit twit army not army right not the army Iraq. right although he is in Iraq. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh that is it for this episode of tech news today jeff bacalar thanks for uh joining us man it's always uh, good to hang out right on guys thanks for having me let folks know where they can uh, find your work online subscribe to the 404 all that good stuff yeah, uh, cnet.com slash the 404. We're on iTunes and all that good stuff. We just had a, a really funny and interesting interview with uh, uh, Big Boy and B.O.B., these two nice. uh, hip-hop stars, which was very interesting. I fit right in, and it was very good. <laughs> As you would. Uh, thanks again, man. Uh, thank you, folks, for submitting stories in our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. It is a place where 15,000 or so people get together and say, I think TNT should cover this today. And we, we pay attention to that. We look at those votes and we, uh, and we adapt our lineup. It's not like gospel. It's not like we pull it straight out of there, but it definitely helps us figure out what you guys are into. So go in there and vote on stuff. Vote it up. Vote it down. If you want, that's the beauty of the subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. You can also find us on the web 24-7 at twit.tv slash TNT. Email us TNT at twit.tv or give us a call. Leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. Friday is tomorrow. That means Derek Kitchen is with us tomorrow. We'll see you then.